Oh my God, my Father who is in heaven. We, your children, from my brothers and sisters in Lagos, Lord, they're crying for you and for your spirit to come down and teach and lead us and direct us that forever in our life, we will only hear one voice, the voice of the shepherd, nothing uttering that. Because the Bible told us one thing, whoever has to wait, whoever puts anything into the word of God, whoever modifies it, whoever tries to please other people with his own doctrinal theory, or is suppressed to it, then that individual's name will be out of the book of life. That is God will have. So what, what God is telling us, when Christ came, remember he said that Christ was the fullness of God, the fulfillment of God, the nature, the character of God for us to see. In other words, what God was telling us, that is all and all. None of us should ever be looking anyone to tell them anything different from what Christ has said. Because Christ never deviated from what the Father who sent him said. This is one thing we have to understand. God made this final sacrifice for this very purpose. That no one should ever be deceived or be misled anymore. And that there should not be any excuse anymore. Because he has presented himself wholly and totally. So brothers and sisters, if you walk, if you only what? Absorb. If you only live and become the word of Jesus Christ. If you walk as he walked, if you imitate him as he was, conduct, you shall not go wrong. Because the Bible told us it's the fullness of everything. Can we look at John 1, please? From 1, Pastor Charles. John chapter 1 from verse 1. Yes, sir. You can go from verse 1. Even I don't, let's, I'll stop you. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Thank there you. Was... Th thank you. Thank you, Pastor Charles. In him was the fullness of life. I want to please understand this is the scripture. I didn't write this thing. And the life was the light of men. This is the only light of men. That is why the scripture tells us one thing, that all that we need to know about God has been made manifest through Christ, in fact, in him. First of all, can we look at Romans 1, please? 17 to 21. Romans 1, 17 to 21. Yes. For in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Mm -hmm. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men mm -hmm. who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may oh, be... Hold on, Pastor Charles. Who suppressed the truth in unrighteousness? Brothers and sisters, listen to me. And it's going to be, in other words, anything from any man or woman on this earth, would it deviate, even in the slightest measure, 
which is not wholesome. What is wholesome is 100%. 99% of the of truth is a lie. So he said, those who suppress the wholesomeness of the truth, they only do it, listen to the Bible. They only do it for themselves. They do it, they suppress it for the sake of unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is that which actually I'm doing for myself because it's unrighteous, it's of the flesh. It is, a, it is an opposite of righteousness. So I want you to listen to what the Bible says. Go on, please, Pastor Charles. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Mm. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's all right. Let's stop right there. Everything God had manifested himself, my brothers and sisters. That's what I'm trying to tell you right now. Please listen to me. You cannot, even when I say listen to me, you're not, don't, you're not listening to me. If you, if you really pay attention that all you to come to do is to see me and to listen to me, you are, you are wasting your time. I cannot save you. I'm not a savior. But the word of God is a truth that is there. He said there, everything you need to know about God has been made manifest in Christ. Therefore, look no further. Christ is it. And because of that, then, anything we do that's contrary to Christ is against God because we have no more excuse. Do you see now, my brothers and sisters, why Jesus Christ said in John 15, 22, if I have not come, they have no sin. But now after I have come, they have no more excuse. It is over. God is not going to send anybody else. I give God glory. And I'm, because it's going to tie up to what we're, what we're going to talk about right now, my brothers and sisters. I want you to know one thing. There are two major problems. I don't even know if I'm, I want to call them problems. Because problems, sometimes when we talk about problems, we take it so lightly these days. There are two major. Two main things that are, in a way, abominably enslaved, that enslaved us. All of us. I'm talking to you, I'm talking to my people all over in Nigeria. And even all of us are here. Two things that enslave us in bondage. Except that thing, those two things are broken and destroyed. We can never even have anything to do with God to know God. We can set up churches, every building, every corner can be church. Church, church, church. I came to Nigeria at a hard come. Every, every, in fact, every step, every inch. You want me? To, I don't even want me to call it every inch because I have gone to some churches where actually you could not hear hear what I was saying because in that very building you have almost like ten of them or eight of them. I'm not saying there's anything wrong about church about it, but what is the point of having churches all over the place? when actually God is not even there. That's why I'm talking about these two things. And that is why it will take us a little time to try to deal with those two issues. Because once we get those two issues, then transformation will actually take place. And those two major problems, brothers, listen to me. Number one, we don't we have not perfected. We don't know what it means to perfect the fear of God. It is the only requirement of God. It is the only duty that God said we should have. The fear of him. Fear of him is actually to love him. How do you love him? Stop. Stop rebelling against him. Stop offending him. Stop <clears throat> 
sinning against him. <clears throat> that is actually what? What it means to fear God. That's why he said, this is the whole duty of man. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, fear me. That's the way you're going to be able to keep my commandments. I, I, I'm not asking you for any other thing. You go back to that which we have done before in Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, I wish they have the heart for them to know the only thing I want from them. Fear me. The fear of the Lord is to depart from iniquity. The fear of the Lord is to depart from iniquity. And if one cannot depart from iniquity, how in the world are you going to walk with God? Is it possible? It's not. Because in God, there is no darkness. That's why I say that that is the key problem. We went through that before. It's the only requirement to fulfill the purpose of God. The purpose of God is that we be as he is. Remember, my people, in the beginning, Genesis 1, 26 to 27, God created man and woman in his own image. What is the image of God? The image of God is the image of holiness, righteousness, and what? And purity. That's why God said, if anyone has this hope of regaining this image, let him purify, let him not wait for God to do it for you. Let him purify himself as God is. First John 3, 3, stars. First John 3, 3. Yes, sir. And every man who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So it tells you no man can come to him. So that's why I told you that this, this from the, that's why we found ourselves, all of us, in very faulty foundation. The foundation of God is this fear of God. That is all. If you are able to do that, the God said, I will give you my spirit, and my spirit can do those things you cannot do. That's why if you look at what Matthew 6, 33 said, what? Seek first the kingdom. Get the kingdom first. Get the kingdom. And the only way you can get the kingdom is when the king comes in. Right? So when the king comes in, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. But this is the fulfillment of what God said all the way. If you look at Ezekiel, because we have done some of this, and that's why I'm pointing this one, before we get to the, what we're going to talk about today. If you look at that Ezekiel, what, 18, you look at 30 to 30. Pastor, please, can you give us Ezekiel 18, 30 to 31. Ezekiel 18, verses 30 to 31. Yes, sir. Therefore, I will judge you. O house of Israel, mm -hmm. everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God, repent and yes. turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. This is one I want you to listen to. Repent and turn from all, from your transgressions. That is the only thing that God requires. And that's why, that's one key thing that if we don't overcome that, because my people listen to me, God is saying, to me, if I'm a thief, and I'm, am I going to wait for God? God is saying, look, if you want to come to me, stop stealing. Then I said, Lord, you know I am weak, so come and repent for me. How is God going to do that? That's the problem we have. Big time. Go on, Pastor Charles. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed mm -hmm. and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Isn't it what we all lack, my people? A new heart and a new spirit. Because if we have a new heart, which means your mind is also because your mind is what directs your heart. Whatever you want, the desire, your mind is going to go there. So get yourself 
God, this, the heart of God. And his new spirit is going to do those things. So put out that one, my people, as number one. If you want to overcome, if you want to be and fulfill what God is talking about, that is it. If you do it, God will give you the heart. If God gives you his heart, that heart is a heart of purity, is a heart of love. And that is where the second point, you see, the second thing that keeps us in perpetual bondage is also dependent on the first one. Everybody, please, every issue, even following God, even fulfilling God's will, they are all dependent on this first issue. Fear of God. It is the foundation of eternal life. And some people may say, oh, how am I going to be able to do that? How am I going to be able to do that? I'm not seen at all. And we look at it as it's that very difficult to do. But if I say, oh, I, I don't know how to do that. I cannot do it. I'm saying I don't want to do it. My people listen to me, Pastor Martin, all of you there. If I am doing something, who is the person who goes and says, you know this food you right here now, watch me, and you watch me. And I say, I'm putting poison in this food. Eat it. Are you going to eat it? You're not going to eat it. Because you don't want to die. So what stops us from saying no more? Nobody, nothing stops you. But God is not going to do that for you. It's the one, one thing God gave us dominion. He gave us dominion over the flesh, over our flesh. But when we sin, when we sin by Adam, we lost that dominion. And God is saying, if you want to come back to me, that is all you need to do, have dominion. When God created Adam and Eve, there was only one thing he asked them to make sure they don't do. Don't rebel against me. So that's, you see, that's, that's only requirement of God. I've given you everything. I've given you dominion over animals. Everything you want, whatever that is, I've given you dominion. But there's one thing you must never do. Do not rebel against me. The day you do it, you will die. So for all of us, it's like we're all dead. Now, how do we come back to life? That's what it means to be born again. How do I come back then to life? And God said, if you want to come back to life, then you must stop that thing that killed you. You must avoid that thing that killed you. You see a child putting his hand on fire and upon the fire say, oh my God, daddy, mommy, oh, this is too much, this, this and that, what should I do? He said, then stop putting your hand on fire. Isn't that what we do? So people listen to me. And then the second one, which I said is dependent on the first one. There is nothing you can do without fulfilling the first one. The second one is love. In my country, in me, and most of us, we don't even know what love is. In fact, in us, we do not have love. Pure love, as God wants us to love others. Just about everything we do. There is some selfishness in this. There's something about it. There's something we think about. You know, so you see that that's what's killing us right now, even in that country right now, even all of us. But where did this thing even actually, where, where was this thing man, manufactured? In the church, in churches, we preach kill, we preach unforgiveness, but then we claim to be children of God. A child of God is one who is one with God in the image of God. So that is why today, this is a wonderful background that, that God has given to us right now. And this background actually, it actually came from the zeal, the zealousness of Lagos, the hunger, the thirst, even the worship show the spirit of God. So my, 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 my brother and sister, let us listen to him and not to me or to anyone. So even if 
as we go from where we stopped last time we met, I know it's been a while because we took one week off. We go back to that which I call, if you want to make a note of that, call it acceptable spiritual forgiveness. Remember that whatever we do, we don't do it for ourselves or for human beings to accept. You do what you do, it is only going to work if God accepts it, not you. That is why we have to understand one thing. God who created us, he was also the one who selected a purpose, who said, this is the purpose I created man. Man must fulfill that purpose. In the beginning, what was that purpose? The image of God. Follow, follow me, my people. The image of God. Then, what is the purpose for us now? To, for, to come back and regain that image. Remember, my people, that's why we started when, when this, this, this very Lagos issue. We started from, if you go to church, you must know the purpose. You want to do business. You must know the purpose. Whatever you want to go to school, what is the purpose? Then if you do not, or I do not fulfill that purpose, I have only labored in vain. I'm wasting my time. If I pursue my own purpose, then I'm pursuing my own will to do my own will. And then what's going to happen? I will not satisfy the owner. God is the king who has set the purpose for us, for choosing us. No, first of all, for calling us to himself. And that purpose we said, what? Is actually to be conformed to his image, to regain what was lost the image that was lost. Listen to me carefully as we go through this forgiveness because that is why love and this thing we're talking about forgiveness, they are one and it's going to take time. We may take time. We're not rushing. Thank God we meet. It's not a question of, oh, this is one sort or, or only twice. Take note and pay attention because that's going to be one problem that we have continuously. If we defeat it, we have a chance. So, if we go back to where we started before, Romans 8, 28 to 29. Romans 8, 28 and 29. Yes, sir. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, Pastor, listen, my, my people, you know, that's why we normally stop, right? You people, you pastors over there, we love it. And we know that all things, oh yeah, all things work together for good for those who love God. But then, you see, that's why we stop. And first of all, we don't even ask ourselves, who are those who love God? Are you following me, my people? Yes, who are, we don't even ask that question. Who are those who love God? You have to define that. Not even to talk about this. We don't even worry about getting to, to, to those who are called according to his purpose. We never even have ever asked this question. What is his purpose for us? That's why God is here. Open our eyes. Who are those who love God? And what is that purpose that God has for us? Not our own purpose, but his purpose according to the election. So that's a purpose. Hence, hence, listen to me. If the purpose is what? Pastor 29. 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The image of the son is the image of God. And we know what the image of God is. If you have this accepted, if you accept and you hold it so firm, completely, that 
this is what the image of God is, then, of course, why do I have to, why do I have to talk to you anymore about what being as God is? If that is the image of God, you are one with God. You are as God. That's the same image, my people. Listen to me of God. But it's only going to tell you, listen what carefully there. Even right there, he tells you who is a true Christian. One who is born again. He said that, that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, who is this Christ? Christ is the image of God. Remember, please, 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 my people, thank God for what God is doing because of you. Christ is the image of God. Christ being the image of God, Christ is as God is. What is the image of God, my people? Image of purity. Image of love. Forgiveness. You go back to what God has done for you. Then, among the brethren. In other words, nobody is considered as what? As a member of this brethren of Christ. As a, mem as a member of true Christ what they call it, true church of God, Christians. Oh my God, glory be to your name. Except the person is also in the image of Jesus Christ. Are we, are, do we understand it that way? God bless all of you. Except the person is in the same image of Jesus Christ. So what does that tell us? Now, same image in the beginning it tells us the same. Failure which, if we're not in this image, my people, we are none of his. That's what he's saying here. Okay? We're none of his at all. So that is why the Bible tells us one thing. If we are as he is, then we should love as he loves. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm one, everything about Pastor Martin, that's the way I am. How do I show that? Is that there is no difference between what I do and what Pastor Martin does. Period. If there is a difference, then I am not in his image. I am not of him. Reason why Jesus Christ said, whoever is not with me is against me. If you are not together one with me, you are against me. So we are told, please, everybody follow. We must stay as long as God wants us. I'm not talking only, only today. Even when we meet, until this thing sinks in. Because that's going to set you free and set others free. So let us listen at that. When Bible, we don't have to go to that. You have it. We have done it before. If you go back to Matthew 5, you go to 45, 43 to 48. Remember what they say, love your enemies. Love this and that. If you love like other people, the world love the world loves. Then you are of the world. If you love like your father loves, you are of your father because that's the only thing that what will distinguish you from the world. But if we catch up this only, would you know? For chat Matthew five, let us only cut off from maybe forty five, please. 45 from verse 45 to 48, yes. To 48. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. Mm -hmm. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Do you understand this? Do you understand what God is telling us in here? That you may be the sons of your father. That you may be like your father. That's why I said, love your enemies. Please listen to me. And then he, 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 he didn't stop there. He came back clearly to say, look at how God is. Oh my gosh. He does not withhold the good, good from the evil. He doesn't. Why, why, why is he doing that? Paraventure, the evil one may change and come to him. Remember the ultimate will of God is that nobody should perish, but let them come to repentance. How are you going to give them opportunity and chance for that to happen? Now listen. 
God manifesting, showing the kind of love that he wants us to have. He makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He does not withhold what? What is doing that son from the evil? Everybody listen. I'm talking about God. I'm not talking about the way the world loves. With the world, you love those who love you. Those who hate you, you stay away and you hate them. That's the world. But if we're still do, if we're doing the same thing, God is saying here, you're not my children because they're not listening to me. There is a reason why I want you to do what I want you to do. I want you to eliminate debt problem from you. And I send my God to work on just and the just. So, Pastor, go on, please. Verse 46. For if you love those who love you, mm -hmm. what reward have you? Okay. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Hmm. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. That one is clear. You shall be perfect. It shall not be found. There shall not be any fault found in you. It should be blameless. But there is something he's saying here. For if you love those who love you, what reward? Do not even the taxpayers, the sinners, do the same. What, what is this? What is the Bible telling us? He's telling us, I want you to know one thing. The, world, the one you do what he does, that's the one who is your master. Oh, my goodness. The one you do what he does, that's the one who's your master. Because if you do it like the sin, sinners of the world, you are the sinner of the world. You are there. What difference do you have? They, they say, There's a difference because you go to church. That's why we started with the purpose. Why do you go to church? If the purpose is to fulfill the, the, the image of God, then if you are in that image, this will never happen. Okay? So I want you to please pick up that Lagos. And that is why the Bible said, if you want your love to be acceptable to God, to meet the standard, the image of God said you should have. The same thing he said in what? Matthew 5, 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect in law. That's why he goes for that to tell us clearly what he's saying. Our love for it to be perfect, acceptable to God, it must be as God loves. First John 4, 17, please. Yes. John chapter 4, verse 17. Yes, sir. Love has been perfected among us in this, mm -hmm. that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. What is having boldness in the days of judgment? That we may know that actually we are working according to his word, will, and we, are, we have a chance of making it. Please listen to me. We have a chance of making it if we conduct ourselves on this earth as he is. Everybody, please pick it up. You cannot be in one's image and you are doing something different and contrary to that image. Otherwise, you're just merely doing what? Deceiving yourself. And Christ came down again in a way that anybody should be able to pick up. If you want to be a true Christian, if you want to be a true disciple, a true follower, a true believer, you must love as I love you. That is you. As I had mercy and pity on you and as I love you, you must love others. You were an enemy. You hated me. You were sinning. But I loved you and I died for you. If you don't do that, you are not my disciple. You are not a true Christian. Now, make note. I always say a true. Because there are so many people who call themselves Christians. But I'm saying a true Christian. A true Christian is the one that God accepts. 
as his child. That's all. Not me to determine who is the citizen. John 13, 34 to 35, please. Chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Yes, sir. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all we know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. By this, all we know that you are my disciples. I don't even care that much about other people knowing I'm God's disciple. The only thing I care about that, that, if that what I do will bring them to God. But you see, I care more. Have I done it in a way that's acceptable to God? Okay? Because God ultimately, God is the one who knows who is his disciple. And let's make note of that. Because he told us one thing. That he, God, knows those who are his. Not those who claim to be his. God knows who are his. And he knows those who love him. So that judgment decision belongs to him. Now, what kind of love was the text was talking about? And this is why you have to worry about when we talk, talk about this forgiving others as God has forgiven us. Christ said, and we don't have to put that scripture, you know it. In Matthew 15, 13 to, 13 to 14, says, there is no greater love than this. That one gives his own life for others so that others might live. If the spirit of God, if you are truly transformed and the spirit of God is in you, your flesh or what happens to you does not really make that much difference anymore. Everything you are doing now, if you have to die, die for another to get what you got. Because eventually, my brothers and sisters, all of us, were going to die here. What matters is eternal life, what God is telling us. So what does it take for you to bring others unto God? Please listen to me carefully. But in saying that, Jesus Christ doubled up. He doubled up and down. I'm telling you, doubled up and down. I said, I want you to also know that's why when you see when you see 14, when you see Matthew, <laughs> when you see Matthew 15, 14, following that, he said, Let me tell you one thing. You are only my disciples. You are only a true Christian. If you do, if you keep all my commandments. Now that's where our problem is. If we keep all my commandments, not selective on what you want to keep. If we keep all my command, and his commandment here is that you love as I love you. That's the commandment. Pastor is putting that up. You know, after it's amazing, Pastor is amazing after greater love has no one than this, than to lay his life. Then he turns around and said, You are my disciples if you do whatever I command you. Then, then ask me. What does he command us? That is an issue that we should understand. He commanded, obey all. Or you are not my followers. Now that will give you something to think about and give me something to think about. Am I a true follower of Jesus Christ? And then he turns around and said, I want you to do this. Forgive all people with a pure heart. What is a pure heart? And that's why I said we'll just go everything back to the foundation. If anyone leaves the foundation, it is over. Forgive all with a pure heart. The only way you can have a pure heart is that no sin. So even if I told you do something, somebody does something against you, and you know what they're going to do, maybe offensive to God or sinful, then that foundation will make you to say, oh, no way. I'm not doing this at all. And you have to do that for what he told us, as I forgave you. 
Remember one thing, my people. What is love? Love is love. Leading to this forgiveness. How did he tell us to love? He said, love all other people as I have loved you. That tells you everything. Forgive all people as I have forgiven you. Oh my goodness. Let us see this. Which will, sometimes we read this condition. But Mark, Mark, and Mark captured what I'm telling you right now completely. Pastor Charles, could you please look at Mark 11, 25 to 26? Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Yes, sir. And whenever you stand praying, hmm. if you have anything against anyone, listen okay. to listen to what Pastor Chad is reading. Go on, please. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. If there is nothing, all this we'll be talking about, if uh, all that, not none of them sank into your heart. Right? Let this one then sink them. It is, that's it. The line is drawn. And God is telling you. But I like this portion because I, when actually, the way he wrote, this was written, and whenever you stand praying, which we all do, you know, we, we, we pray, we pray, we pray. And there's nothing about pray, nothing wrong with pray. Pray with that season. But I know that the problem that I have, or problem we have, is that my people pray more than they obey. And remember we talked about that. It is not prayer that is going to get you to, to for God to, to do anything. It is obedience. God didn't ask you to pray, 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 pray. Say, obey me if you love me. But anyway, that's part of that day. Let's not worry about that. But it tells you, if you start praying, because most of you start praying a lot, now begin to recount back how many vain prayers you have, you have prayed. <laughs> Completely vain. A sacrifice of a fool because one is praying and not doing what God has said you. If you have anything at all against anyone, or anyone has offended you, that you you have something against someone, forgive. And you have to do that because you are doing it for yourself and for the person. That your father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you don't forgive, then you are holding that person captive and you are holding yourself because why? Your father will not forgive you. Forgive as Christ forgave you. Let us think about this. Heavenly Father, you see these people, wicked, so horrible, crucifying me on the cross. They are crucifying me for the good I have done for them. I came to save them, they might have life, to tell them the truth. But Lord, they turned against me and crucified me and killed me. Forgive them. Forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Pastor Charles, Luke 23, 34, please. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Yes, sir. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now, I want you to know what it will come back to this before we finish this very afternoon or evening in Lagos. We'll come back to this and you see the deeper things that Christ did here. But I just, I'm trying to point out where Christ was just saying, forgive as I forgive. You crucified him on the cross. I crucified him. For my sake, he died there. And he said, forgive them. And when we come back, you find out why 
He said we should forgive them. And why also you, you should forgive all people the same way, that way. But uh, let, let us look at, we come, we come to it. But we want to see exactly what the Bible commanded us. Forgive as I forgave you. This is the only way you can show gratitude to God. As you did unto me, I am in turn returning good for the good you did for me. Not returning evil for good. Ephesians 4, 32, please. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Yes, sir. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. At least the the least. Listen, listen, listen. Well, look at look at this. Look at this scripture. What is telling you the least thing you can do, the least thing that expected of you. That thing that is so least that God is based on you is that at least, at least, forgive others as Christ forgave you. Is that asking too much? It's not as God is not asking too much there. You see, what I gave you, please extend to others. That is all this asking. Colossians 3, please. 13. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Yes, sir. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So what is it? Again, let me go this way. When I say at least, the least, that is the minimum. The minimum that is expected of you is that at least you should have pity and mercy on others as Christ, as God had for you. Therefore, this is the conclusion we should have. One who does not forgive others does not have God because does not have love. I want you to note that the person is yet not born of the spirit of God. If there's anybody you have not forgiven, you have not been born of the spirit of God. What am I saying? The individual is not a true Christian, a disciple or believer. Or a follower of Jesus Christ. Not one with him, but against him. Because that person does not have the fruit of the Holy Spirit whatsoever. What am I saying there? The fruit, no fruit of the, a true Christian is one who is Christ like. We said it before. One who does all whatsoever he has commanded. Now, if you pause, why I said all these things, then you look at it from this angle. A born again spirit of God is a spirit of God. We have done that before. And where the spirit of God is, the Bible tells us how you know the spirit of God is there. How you know that love is there. Then there is liberty manifested. There is freedom. There is no captivity or bondage. Are we all together? Where the spirit of God is, you there cannot is hold yourself or hold others captive and in bondage. Because the spirit of God is life, it's not death. Now, I want us to understand this. Second Corinthians, please, 317. Second Corinthians 317. Yeah, after, with 317, let's talk about then 18 also. Some, Second Corinthians 317. Yes, sir. Now, the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty and freedom, yes. But we all, with unveiled face. That is if we have unveiled face. Hmm. Most of us are still have veiled face in darkness. If the veil had been removed from our own eyes, that's what he's saying. Okay, go on. 
beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord mm -hmm. are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen, Pastor Child. That is, is it tells it all there. The glory of God. That's why it's Christ in us. Why is it beholding as it is the glory of the Lord? Being transformed into his image, that means he's in us. And we are in him. If that is truly that the case, we are born again. Then he's saying, the glory of the Lord, which is actually the hope of our glory, is Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, in us. That is the prince of peace. If he's not there, the prince of love, if that is not there completely the way it is, we are claiming we are born again, let us think twice. When the Spirit of God is upon you, you set the captive free, beginning from yourself. Because whenever somebody is imprisoned by you, because of their unforgiveness, you are also in prison with him. In fact, your own imprisonment is almost like life one, because you are killing yourself, not that person. Pastor, please. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. Isaiah 61, chapter, uh, chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. Yes, sir. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, mm. to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound, bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. One moment, Pastor Charles. Why? Why? The Spirit of God is on us. Why is it upon us and what is there to do? It to set the captive free. If you read the scriptures well, my people, look at verse 2. You cannot proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and his vengeance, which means that those who don't believe in him and those who don't, don't, don't what, turn away from their wicked ways and turn to him, they will face the vengeance of God. If actually you do not set them free, how are you going to proclaim this to them? How are you going to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord when you have somebody in prison, when you have somebody in captivity, when actually you have alienated somebody from yourself? Because the one you hate, the one you don't forgive, you don't even begin to talk about the Lord. And if that happens, you have failed. You're not bearing fruit of what God said you should do. So let us make sure we catch some of these things because God is seeing something in Lagos, in you people, and he's pouring his heart to you. It's up to you to listen. And I pray to God and I believe that you would be able to listen and know this is his truth and not a truth of any man or any man talking to you. So this is one thing I want us to understand. Pastor, did we finish it? No. Well, we didn't finish it. I don't know what, what it is. Okay. But People are, uh, we're going to talk, let's go to three. Okay. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Do you see why you have to take the captive free to fulfill the ultimate will of God that no one should perish? If that is not your preoccupation or the only food that you have or what you are called to do, then there's a big problem because actually you're not following God. There's only reason why God called us to be conformed to his image. Then, among the called, 
He chose some to fulfill always his will, to bear fruit, bring people to the kingdom, turn people from their wickedness, that which is killing them. Let's understand that. So what am I saying? The spirit of God sets all free from captivity. If indeed the spirit of God is in one, it sets them free from captivity, imprisonment, bondage, and any stumbling block, anything, any conduct that hinders one or any other person. Oh, oh no, 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 let's put this up. Any conduct that hinders you because unforgiveness will hinder you from seeing God and any hindering anybody, any person at all from fulfilling the ultimate will of God, which is what? That they should repent. Give them opportunity to repent. It may take one day. It may take one year. It may take 10 years. It's none of your business. What God has commanded you to do is to give that person the opportunity the way he gave you and allow him, allow God to do what he wants to do with the person. Do not frustrate whatever happens in your life. If one frustrates the ultimate will of God, that individual is of the devil and is not serving God. So that is why unforgiveness is sin. Are you listening to me? Lagos, are we there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, unforgiveness is being the true devil. Listen carefully, please, 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 please. Because unforgiveness amounts to holding yourself and others captive and bondage. And that's what the devil does. So I want you to know that. But the spirit of God ministers life, love, hope, peace, joy. That's the spirit of God. That's what they call the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Galatians, please. 5, 22 to 23. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Yes, sir. But the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, my people, listen to me. If you look at this, all these fruits of the Holy Spirit, and then you think about true for, uh, forgiveness of others, everything that is listed here, when you forgive others from a pure heart, in all godly sincerity. Believe me, it actually embodies all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love. You've shown love. You have joy. You have brought joy into the kingdom of God and joy for yourself and others. Peace. Oh my goodness. Is it not what it is when you forgive others? Long suffering. You have shown patience and long suffering like the Lord, because you are in the, his image, you are one with him. Goodness, kindness, that's what has shown. Faithfulness, gentleness, you have also controlled yourself. You did not go off and begin to act the way you used to be. You know, some of you will always say, well, I'm telling you, if, if, Oh, he's lucky. He is so lucky. If actually I'm still the way I used to be, he would have seen fire. He would have seen whom I am. And sometimes we say that with pride instead of tears. And the only way we can just say, well, Lord, if you extend to other forgiveness without even worrying about that, then you can say, Lord, oh my goodness, is that where you have gotten me to? Oh, that's the full of it is not debt. Unforgiveness is sin, and wages of sin is debt for you and possibly others. And most likely, the one who may die, and when I talk about debt, 
I'm talking about spiritual death, the one who actually is likely to die spiritually is the one who refuses to forgive. Uh, the one who has offended him will move on, and maybe you have, you have even repented and move on with God, but you are still held down, and you may be the one. Unforgiveness is doing the work of one's father, the devil. Listen to me. Unforgiveness is doing the work of the devil. You are the person is only the agent of the devil doing his work. Why? Because the Bible told us one thing, the one you do his own work, the work of God is life. He tells you to forgive others because I came to forgive. I didn't come to condemn or judge. So if we do anything contrary to unforgiveness, that means we are doing the work of the devil. If we do the work of the devil, we are declaring that the devil is actually our own God and Father. Everybody understand me, please. John 8, 43 to 44. John chapter 8, verses 43 and 44. Yes. Why do you not understand my speech? Mm -hmm. Because you are not able to listen to my word. Okay. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. So, in other words, whoever you do, whoever you do his desire, okay? Or when I, when I keep saying you, you, I'm talking about we, please, I'm talking about myself. Whoever will do his desire, that's the one who is our Lord and our Father. That's what he's saying there. Because the desire of one is his will. If we're not doing the will of God, we're doing the will of our own will, which is the will of the devil. That's in control. That's why the scripture tells us one thing, and we don't have to even to put it down. You know it, but we know it. We don't put it to heart. We don't seem to understand it. We don't seem to practice what he's saying that this which Christ has said right there, that whoever does the work of the father is the father, that's the work of the devil, is a child of the devil. The same thing, when he told us one thing, in John 10, 10, which embodies everything, when I'm talking about God is life, the devil is all about destruction. Father Chad, John 10, 10, please. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. This is the difference, my brothers and sisters. Please capture this because if you all get it, this will set us free. This will set us free. I'm telling you right now, do not harden your heart. Listen. To what the word of God is telling you because nobody knows the next second. Nobody knows tomorrow. This is what it is. He's telling you there. The spirit of God is what? The spirit of God gives life. It tells you purely, pure and simple. The mandate. The extent of your mandate. Pure and simple. It tells you what is the so-called commission. No, we always say uh, we have a commission. God commissioned us. What did God commission us? What did Christ commission us? He tells you, I commissioned you for life. Go and bring life. Give people life. Do not kill them. Do not steal from them. And do not destroy them. Because they don't belong to you. And that's not what your father in heaven, that's not his will. It's not the reason why he said to Jesus Christ. I want you to know this. Because he told us one thing. I'm sending my son not to condemn. Unforgiveness is judgment. It amounts to judgment and condemnation. Why am I saying that? For you to make up your mind not to forgive somebody, you have already judged that that person is worthy of whatever evil you think. 
that you will premeditate. I mean, you will just go and think about how you're going to be able to handle that person. You have already judged. We are not commissioned to judge. We are not commissioned to condemn anyone. That's for God. It's for you to plead that God will have mercy. But look at what Jesus Christ said. I didn't come. My father didn't send me for that purpose. He sent me for life. That life should come to him. But start John 3. 17, please. John chapter 3, verse 17. Yes. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, this is the thing. So then what did Christ send us to do? If you look at that Matthew, we don't have to go to even read it. You see Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where he said, well, go unto the world and teach them to observe. Listen to Christ. Teach them to observe whatever I've taught you. You cannot teach anybody to observe anything until you become what you are taught. You cannot. How can you teach somebody when you're not even a teacher? A teacher is one who is qualified to teach. And that's because he has what is given to him is in him to do it. So Christ, that's what he told us to do. Go and teach them. Show them the light that they may come to. To God. So I want you to understand one thing, that this is a situation, this is now the time of any other time in your life or our life to really pause and do what the Bible says. Examine yourself carefully. Are you actually in faith? Are you actually one with Jesus Christ? You call yourself a Christian. Examine yourself. Are you a Christian? 2 Corinthians 13, 5, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Yes. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. In the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Mm. Unless indeed you are disqualified. Oh Lord, open our, oh, open everything in us, Lord. Look at look at these creatures. They're all coming. They're lifted. They're almost like lifted up on the page and coming alive. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Hey, is Christ is in you? That's who is what a Christian is. Christ truly in you. If Christ is in you, you will not, you will not refuse to forgive people. Even before you forgive, you will not even know. You move on because that's what every attention you have and your mind will be to fulfill the desires of Christ, the desires of the Father, just as Christ did. That's what it should be. If actually you say, Jesus Christ is in you. And it tells you there. What I've been saying, if Jesus Christ is not in you or in me, we are disqualified. That's what he's saying. And somebody may say, what am I saying if Jesus Christ is in us? You know, he started, that's where many people have problems. Examine yourself as if to whether you are in faith. We, many do not know what faith means. If you say, what's faith? Say, faith? Faith is a substance of blah, 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 nonsense. But to read the entire scripture and know what faith is. But even this scripture tells us what faith is. Can anybody tell me what faith is? Can anybody tell me what, even looking at this scripture, what is faith? Under you are in the truth. Truth. Ah, you're getting their favor. You're always, uh, God is always uh, speaking to you. But what does that mean? What is being the truth? Christ. Huh? Being in Christ. What is being in Christ? Being of obedience. Being of obedience, Martin. Pastor Martin, please. Faith is obedience. Faith is obedience. Listen to the Bible. In Romans 10, 17, 
Faith comes by hearing. By hearing what? The word of God. Who is the one who has heard the word of God? The one that hears and obeys. The one that hears and obeys. You have not heard the word of God if you don't obey the word of God. Pastor Charles, please, can you give us just only Romans 2.13? 13. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Amen. James 1, 21 to 25. James 1, verses 21 to 25. Yes, sir. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Try. Hmm. And receive. Oh, Pastor, can you please repeat that? Therefore, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Mm, my goodness. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Wow. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Mm -hmm. So he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Try. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. The perfect and... law of liberty. Mm. Go on, my friend. And continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this one will be blessed in what he does in what he does my people he tells you how to set yourself and other people free perfect law of liberty is love love is nowhere if you don't forgive others is that then you don't love you don't know what it is now, I want you to understand this. Again, faith. Listen to me. Faith. We just need to get this whenever we have in the Bible. Look at what the Bible is telling us that there's, there are people who didn't miss what they, they had. They, like us right now. We're hearing what God is telling us. But it's not mixed with faith, some of us. Then that's why we lose it. Hebrews 4, please. 1 to 2. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Yes, sir. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in those who heard it. And then he goes for that to tell us what that not be mixed with faith is. Verse 6, please. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, mm -hmm. and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. They did not enter because of disobedience. That is not the earth that God has asked us to do. You, know, you see now, my people, even when we talk about that, uh, the, how did they put it in uh, Hebrews 11? You see Hebrews 11, the only reason why these people could take plain faith was because of obedience. Hebrews, please, 6, 11. Four to six. Eleven, four to six. Yes. By faith, Abel offered a, to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, mm -hmm. through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, still speaks. You see, the, you see, the faith, the, the faith of Abel was righteousness, obedience. Go on, my brother. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death 
and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That is all I want us to touch there, Pastor Tad. Don't worry, let us move on. That he pleased God. We have done that before by faith. I want us to understand. Sometimes these things come, we have to refresh our listen. So I want you to also then note this. So far as we're going, I want you to note this very important thing. You see, look at the Bible. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, that we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved by Christ through faith in him. Oh my goodness. This is what grace is all about. When talk about, people say, I was saved by grace. Uh, not everybody, not everybody demands to walk. Look, grace came down. We didn't pay for it. Unmerited coming to us. We have dealt with this before. But he tells us that grace finally we find out was Christ telling us what to do. Depart from evil and then become God. Fear God. Perfect that fear. Then he comes here and says, Faith. I know mean, that we are saved by grace. We are saved by Christ. But it is only through faith in Him. It is only through obedience in God. In Him means what? As He is. That is why Christ didn't even, oh my, try, Christ just told us plainly, plainly, as He went on, the same Christ. You look at John 15, 4 to 6. Say, if you have to, if you want to have faith in me, abide. In fact, Pastor Chad, let, let's only read John 15, 5 and 6. Don't even 4 and 6. Pray with me. I'm high in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. But Neither look at 15. I, God bless you, Pastor. 15. Uh, John 15, 15. 15 to 16. That's all I did. Okay, John 15 from 15 to 16. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. Yes. I have called you friends for all things I've heard from my father I've made known to you. Mm -hmm. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. But then let's, have, let's, let's, let's join that with the same chapter, only 5 and 6. Now, John 15, 5 and 6. Yes. I am the vine, mm. you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Trust if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And then the question you ask yourself is this, so that you were not confused. What is to abide in him? The same thing we'll be talking about, about faith through, oh, about what? Through faith in him. First John 3, 24, please. First John 3, 24. Yes. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. Mm -hmm. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. You see, my people, now he who keeps his commandment abides in him. And because of that, if you abide in him, he will abide in you. And that's the way he's going to walk. How do you abide in him? Obey all he has commanded. Love others as he has loved you. Now, because for where we are right now, let us look at this special note, note okay? Let's take note of this special thing so we can understand. And I pray to God that God will give us this understanding and raise this small remnant that he has there in Lagos. And this can overtake the whole place, even in Nigeria, if God... If we do not turn away from anything about God, this special note, we are only saved by grace. We know that. But if you look at this situation, why did Christ 
Look at the reason. Why did Christ tell, tell we have already read it already in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them. You know, they do not even know what they're doing. Why? Can anybody give me why, why he would do that? Because he has come to show us the perfect example. Oh no, I mean, why did he do that? I'm not what well, is the final example. That's not what I'm talking about. Because he wants his father. He does what? Because he wants to be one with his father. How? How how, how favor? You got it, you got it uh, in the very perfect. <laughs> eh? Close to perfect the will of his father. I know that that's that's the second one. I'll I'll, I'll give you that. But what was the first first one? Because Why would, what is the first reason I should forgive you? Love. Because of love. Because of love. What does that love tell you? God is love. love. Yes. Love. Because it, love. God is love and love is God. Forget about it. I know that. I know you got it. The reason why, let me tell you one thing. Look at what he said. Father, Forgive them for what? See what Christ is telling the Father? Father, forgive them because they were ignorant in what they're doing. Anyone who is still doing evil is ignorant. He doesn't know God. Now, I'm not saying, Christ is not saying that they didn't know that actually they nailed him on the cross. They knew that. Spiritual. But spiritually, they did not know God. And if you don't know God, you don't fear God, you do not know what you are doing. That's what God sent his only begotten son to come and do. Not to seek the righteous, but the lost and bring them. So how are you going to be able to bring the lost when immediately they do something, you condemn them and judge them? Because Paul told us, all I did, God had mercy on me because I was doing them in ignorance. So someone doing evil, physically in the flesh, he knows what he's doing that is doing evil. Spiritually, that's why if you are in the spirit, your eyes will be open. You will see in the spirit. You will walk in the spirit. You will know that somebody who is actually doing evil to you, you will pity him. Because if I've known better, if you know that, if it's actually the spirit of God is in him, he will not do that. And then, what causes you to do that? When you realize what you did, what you were doing, and how you will have mercy how God had mercy and pity on you, then you will know how to also forgive others. The Bible told us because Jesus Christ suffered and died, then for that, he actually also knows how to deliver those who are suffering because he faced it. If you cannot teach somebody what you have faced, if you cannot be an example, say, I have gone through this experience and I want another one to get that experience. Then you got a problem. And then the second one is also doing exactly what favor answered us. The ultimate will of God. The ultimate will of God. If you have preoccupation and everything that's in you, everything, the spirit of God is actually in you. The Spirit of God is only looking and focusing on bringing joy to God. So whatever happens, no matter whatever pain, no matter how it will be to you, humble yourself and then be able to bring joy to your Father. The long suffering. The Bible tells us, if you look at Second Peter 3 and 8, that the long suffering of God is for our salvation. But if you look at verse 15, it says the long suffering of Jesus Christ 
is for our salvation. If you cannot suffer like him for the salvation of others, then what are you doing? You say you are the disciple of his? Of course you're not, because they're not bearing fruit that remain. So this is one thing that I want all of us to understand. The heart, the mind of Christ, being the heart of the Father, the mind of the Father, the desire of the Father, the only will of the Father. That's why he said in John 5.30. Pastor Chad, John 5.30, please. John chapter 5, verse 30. Yes, sir. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So whatever anything happens to you and you realize and the Spirit of God lets you know, if the Spirit of God is in you, the Spirit of God will tell you, say, this is not about you. Favor, Martin, Peter, every one of you, innocent. This is not about you. It's not about your stupid pride. It's about God. What would bring joy to my father? That is what he has chosen you for and to fulfill. That's why Christ said, he did not choose me. I chose you to go and bear fruit. And that fruit may remain. And that's why Christ also told us, he opened the door, look, this is the will of my father to fulfill it. I should not lose anybody. I should not lose anybody through my conduct. It should never happen. John 6, 38 to 39, please. John chapter 6, verses 38 and 39. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Hmm. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. How do you know that actually the one who has caused offense, who have done evil to you, that that person is not the one that God has given to you to bring to him? How do you know? Since you think you are smart, you are the one to judge and you are the one to condemn. How do you know that that person is not one? Remember, there were people crucifying Christ and everything. But only God, which I mean, Christ being one of God, he knows the heart. He knows those who are even, who are, who are actually so devastated. They were crying. In fact, maybe repented there. We don't know. In fact, including the thief. Remember, my people, including the thief. The right hand side, he repented. He talked, he, he spoke to Christ. How do you know? In every situation you find yourself, how do you know what God is going to do with it? You don't know. If you are a child of God and the Spirit of God is in you, that's when actually the Spirit of God will let you know. You don't even know. I'm doing what actually will bring joy unto God. I want you to also take note of this. Christ did not stop there. What else did Christ do? With all these things happening, do you know what he was doing was interceding for the for the people. Not only that he forgave, he asked the Father to forgive. Most of you will say, well, I have forgiven. I have left it unto God. And God said, I can see the heart. You say you left it unto me, but in your heart he's saying, Lord, you, you, you know what to do. Go and, go and take vengeance. <laughs> you see, what is in your, let us stop deceiving ourselves, okay? What is in your thought and intent God sees? So God wants to see a pure heart. That's why we always have to go back to that foundation and make sure it is solid. Because whatever we say is not going to be what we're saying, what's coming out of our mouth. God knows what's going on. So Christ interceded for his accusers and killers. He pleaded to the Father. He pleaded to the Father. Do not hold this against them. 
for they were ignorant and they all needed help. They needed help. They needed tender mercy and they needed the healing. I am the way, the light, which he told us, as long as we're on, the, on this earth, we're the light of the world. Let our light shine at that point so that all that may see the goodness of the Lord to follow him. Same thing that Stephen did. Stephen said, Father God, forgive these people and don't hold it against them. Stephen, being stoned to death, as of Apostle 760, verse 60, please. 7, verse 60. Yes. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, mm -hmm. Do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Mm. Do not hold this against them. You see somebody that is not only like forgiving those people, he's pleading to the Lord. Come because of this thing. Finish them. That is why my brothers and sisters, that true love must, must bear fruit true and spiritual forgiveness acceptable to God. And it can only happen if it is true love and true forgiveness if it's flowing from a pure heart. A pure heart is not possible except it is that what is on what? The perfect fear of God that gives no room whatsoever to any pollution. Listen to me. A heart, a mind, that give no room to any pollution. Therefore, that's why true love is love without deceit at all. No deceit at all. No hypocrisy, no partiality. A heart that forgives all people unconditionally and intercedes for them. It is not enough to just forgive, intercede, because that's what is we are called to do. Not only just prayers, oh, I pray for, I pray for them, do good. And never withhold anything at all, any good from them. I want you to know that. That's why this, the, Christ was saying, this is your father. He doesn't withhold the sun. He doesn't withhold the rent from anybody. You don't withhold any good from coming to that because if you do, that means you have not forgiven, you are still angry. Now, I want to, us to know one thing and then we will close because I want us to really get this. This, all that what God is teaching us today, if we can go home and really think about them and really focus on them, then you will see why we all need to be truly born, be born again. The spirit of God taking over, spirit of love, spirit of mercy, compassion. And even when we come back again, you will see where this will lead you. Without it, that's not anything about God. But we're not going to be so overloaded today. So I just want to know one thing, for us to know one other thing. I want to say, why would God, for you to go home, I ask yourself, what, why would God not forgive me if I don't forgive all other people? You know, we, we, look, we read that look, right? Where he said, look, if you stand in prayer and then you remember that there's somebody that you have not forgiven, don't waste your time. I will not receive you. What does that tell you? In a nutshell, unforgiveness is disobedience because that's what God has commanded. You cannot tell me you are the true follower of Jesus Christ when you disobey him. Everybody, please. I mean, this is as simple as we can get to it. Sin is disobedience. If you disobey God, you have sin. And we have heard and learned that sin separates us from God. What does that mean? It means that actually God will not hear us. 
And that's why he said, if you don't forgive others, I will not forgive you. And once sin is there, any other thing you are doing is useless. I'm praying, I'm praying. You are wasting your time. <clears throat> because God does not hear sinners. That's what actually John 9.31 told us. That God does not hear sinners. Now, I want you to understand one other thing. God does not hear sinners. We say that. And then the other thing that whenever we do not forgive, we actually manifest what? Very wicked ingratitude. As you have done unto me, I have refused to do un unto others. Think about that, how God will feel. We also will get to that when we come to next time, that how God will react to that. You must forgive all. You must forgive all. Not one, not two, not three. All. Anyone that is held captive in your head, in your heart, must all go. That's why the Bible says, forgive all. If you have, if you look at Matthew 6, from 12 to 15, it tells you, forgive all. But also, James 2.10 tells you, if you obey all, and you break one, you have broken all. Now, all the time, this is the thing that is actually something we need to all really make note. You must forgive all the time. It doesn't matter whether the person has killed you one million times, you must forgive all the time for your own sake in particular. Because whenever there is, whenever there's, um, this is a commandment of God, forgive. There is no way God has told you if anybody does anything to you, don't forgive. Which means that's a commandment. Anytime you don't make that happen, the problem there is that you have actually what? Mortgage your soul to the enemy to come and explore and to do that which is only pleasing to him. All the time, the Bible told us, do it all the time. If you look at Matthew, please, 18, Pastor Charles. Matthew 18. Yes. You can see 15. Let's look at that only for now. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So I think that's what I want us to do. Let's, 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 we can end that today. Saying when somebody has offended you, normally the way of the world, of the flesh that you wait, for the person to come and say, sorry, okay? But God is telling you, go to him. Go, try to make peace. And when we come back next time, you'll find out why it is so important to make peace, to pursue it. You have to seek peace and pursue it yourself. If you don't, you are not a child of God. Why? There is no righteousness. There is no what? The image of God is impossible without peace. And that we will see when we come back. Do not wait for the person, the offender. And because the Bible said, you, you, who now is the light? You who knows the spirit of God? The spirit of God is in you. Go and pursue peace and seek it. Pastor Psalm 34, 11 to 14. Psalm 34, 11 to 14. Yes, sir. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and lost many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. 
Now, it is very, very interesting, Pastor Dad, when we look at that verse 14, when the Bible says, depart from evil and do good. Then he goes further, semicolon, telling you, that's not enough. If you don't seek peace and pursue it, you're not doing good. And you have not departed from evil. Seek. Go after. Pursue it. Go after. Go after. Whatever you do, do not let it elude you. So when we come back, my people, you will see why God has told us, whatever you do, do not let mercy, love, and mercy forsake you. Do not let love and mercy forsake you. Forgiveness is an act of mercy. Blessed are the peace make the, the who, those who are merciful, those are the only ones who are going to find mercy, get mercy from God. And that's why he said, if you don't forgive, I will not forgive you. Blessed are the pure in heart. Is your heart pure when there's unforgiveness? No. And that means you will not see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Those are the only ones who shall see God. Again, he doubled on that one. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who pursue peace. Those who seek peace and pursue it. Those are the ones who are true children of God. Heavenly Father, give you praise and give you glory forever. Yeah. Lord, I don't know what we can say concerning your children in Lagos. And even for us, what do we say? For all your coming down and trying to break into pieces and trying to reach us and trying to break into us, they harden the heart of men. And to even elaborately elaborately, Lord, told us the two things that must be overcome in my country and in all of us and in, indeed all mankind to be as God is. That is perfect the fear of you. Depart from iniquity for there is no other thing we can do except that happens. Then that will lead us to perfect love because then if we do perfect fear of you, depart from all iniquity, you will come. You will give us a new heart. You remove the heart of stone. And all these things we are worried about now, about forgiveness and love, will disappear because you will give us a heart of flesh. Oh Lord, pour your spirit upon your children in Lagos, upon Nigeria. Grant people a heart of flesh, Lord. Remove heart of wickedness. Wickedness, evil, abominable evil. Remove it, Lord, from them. Remove it, Lord. Father, even to your churches, go and overhaul that place and let the leaders, this one who call themselves Jews and all big people, let them know the hour has come. Let my children go. Go, set them free from captivity and imprisonment and bondage that they may serve me in truth and in spirit. Everlasting and true living God, I commit your children, these ones gathered in Lagos, into your holy and mighty hand. Sustain them. Keep them yourself. Let them remind them every day it's all about you. It's not about me. It's not about any other human being. It's all about you, Lord. It's about fulfilling your purpose that your glory may shine and that no Lord, mighty God, it may be also their own glory. Everlasting and true living God, I thank you for them. I thank you for all the people we are using there. I thank you for the, oh Lord, the spirit of hunger and thirst you have given to these people that are always there after you, seeking. You have given them the heart, the heart after God. Perfect that heart and let nothing, my God, steal it away from them. I pray you, Lord, to make, to make an everlasting covenant with them their families, and even my God, I pray, for your name's sake, for the sake of these ones, let their co that covenant, mighty God, spread over and reach out, reach over Nigeria. Oh my God, I thank you. I pray, Lord, for peace for them, their families, and peace for Nigeria. 
I pray, Lord, that you shield them, Lord. I thank you, mighty God, that no matter whatever is going on, even this devastating, even this devastating, Lord, unspeakable pandemic, you have restrained it from coming upon our people the way it has come upon all, even this place where we are right now. What a mighty God who said, I cannot give, I cannot see you suffer more than you can handle. Everlasting God, who's doing this? You're the one restraining it. But this is important. Oh Lord, curse your children for whatever it takes for them to know it's all about you and you're the one doing it. Have mercy, have mercy, Lord. Bless the mighty God who is in heaven. Provide for them their needs. I pray you, Lord, to also, Lord, reach and remind and bring their relatives, their family members, wherever they may be. Father, draw them to yourself that they all may come to the truth and to know you. And I pray, my God, my Father, again, for you to overhaul the churches in Nigeria, the government. Father, let peace, let love, let joy prevail in that country. Take all the glory as I thank you, Lord, for all of them. Father, heal them, those who are not feeling well. You are the healer. The greatest miracle of all things is salvation. And that's why he said, if anyone will get God, all other things shall be added unto them. Add healing, spiritual healing, financial healing, the healing of the mind unto them, Lord. Increase them. Draw more people to you who are after your heart and only there to see, to hear from you. I thank you, Lord, for your children all over here. My, the faithful ones and the mind, Lord, what you have done here in the United States, who are all here and every time. Lord, remember all of them. Remember all of us, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Charles. Thank you, Lord, for what you do with him. Thank you for Pastor Ify, Pastor Godwin. Everyone, Lord, all my brothers and sisters, I cannot see all of them. May Lord Almighty visit all of you, Sister BC, our mommy of Neifani, uh, Brother Ephraim, Pastor Godwin, Sister Rosemary, the iPhone, I don't know who that person is, and I think one in VA is my beloved sister Virgin, uh, Vivian. Sister Gomba, Sister Chidi, Sister Winnie, and all the iPhone, I, don't, I may not see all. May God Almighty be with you. May God Almighty establish you and bless you and your family in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen and amen and amen. 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 Yes, and we have a brethren from India and Colombia who are also online on Facebook. So any comments, any questions, please. Any questions? Um, Pastor Shaz, uh, I have a, a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The question goes like this. Now that we listen to this message of forgiveness, spiritual forgiveness, and you discover that somebody that hurts you and you did not forgive that person at that point of time. So after listening to this message, you discover that the person is no more, that the person is late. What should you do? Should you forgive the dead or you should just let go? No, you can remember that somebody has, because the Bible that we read here said, if you want to pray, and you remember that there is somebody that offend you, that you have not forgiven, go and make peace. So when after this message now, you discover that there is somebody that you did not forgive, and the person is no more, what should you do as a believer or a true Christian? Okay. Who, who is commanded to forgive? God. 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 Who is commanded? I'm not saying who commanded. Who, who okay. is who is told, who is commanded that he has, he has to forgive? The one, the, the one is we. 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 Okay. So forgiveness, the true forgiveness originates from the heart. Your heart. Okay? So 
First of all, you have to make peace in your heart. That is nothing you are holding against that person. God searches the heart. That's all he's trying to see, see right there. There's nothing you have against that individual. The difference is this. If the individual is alive and you say, I don't have anything against this person, but I will never have anything to do with the person. You don't have anything against the person, but you never have anything to do with that person. Have you forgiven the person? No. no. Then when somebody is dead, the person is dead. You want to go dig him out and say, I'm sorry? <laughs> it's not possible. So the forgiveness is your heart. You just, now you have had it. Oh Lord, even cry to God, say, I'm truly sorry that this guy, I did not forgive before he passed away. I forgive it. God knows that now you are a changed person. So it's not for you to worry about it. That's not much you can do. The forgiveness, first of all, becomes real in your heart. Okay, uh, Pastor, uh, Doc, someone has a question as well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And is it possible that, is, is it possible that you are this person, you are once a good friend? Okay, first now, I offended you. You guys have settled the issue. But I now take, I now take my own decision that I've forgiven her. But I don't want to do anything with that again. God has said, now is that. He said, truly, you are forgiven the person. You still need to move with the person. But what about that? When you see the attitude of the person, they don't blend with your attitude. So it's still possible for us to see flow, or I should avoid the person. But deeply, I'm forgiving her. Now, I want you to know one thing. Yes, sir. There's a difference between forgiveness and avoid it. Okay. What I'm saying is this. If, we, if we, there's somebody you are forgiven, I say, I will never talk to the person again. You are still saying it in anger. Listen to what I'm saying. Everything depends on your, your, your heart. You are still saying, I will not talk to him again, and that bitterness is still there. You are lying. You are not forgiving the person. Now, whatever you do, whether it is because whether well, it's forgiving somebody or in any kind of situation, you are told to avoid people. Avoiding people, we, we come to that. Avoid some people. It means this. Do not wrong with them. You said something. If you don't want to do that thing, which is person did anymore, be the party to that thing. Don't be a party to anything that will offend God, whatever it is. It does not mean you hate the person or something good is coming to that person say, I'm not going to give it to him. Or you will not pray for the person and say, God, please have mercy. Or help the individual if you can help. But you're not supposed to wrong with anyone. You're not supposed to do anything. That thing that offended God, don't do it anymore and join to the person. So if, look, somebody said, look, what you're doing is not good. Stop doing that, and then it continues, and it continues, it continues. Look, you make a distance. That distance is not spiritual distance. You don't wrong with the person. You don't do what the same person is doing. You don't even have that kind of association where you are seen always with the person. But in you, there is nothing at all that is bitterness. There is nothing like you can say, oh, if it is something coming to this person, I will not do it, or whatever it is. So you reach out to the person in love, you show love, and do whatever you can do for the person if you have to help. But you don't run. You don't be a partaker of anything that is offensive to God. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Sister, that answers your questions correctly. Sir. Yes, okay. So, any more? Sir, yes. When Doc was uh, teaching, he said something in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10. The thief are, you, are, you sure, are you sure I was teaching? <laughs> go on, go on, go on, you know, sir. 
Thank the Lord. Yeah. He said, The thief cometh not but for steal and to kill and destroy and. Okay, and to destroy. Praise the Lord. Now, my question goes like this. And another, another passage of the Bible says that the weapon of our warfare is not kind of spiritual to pull down strongholds and all that. Now, my question is this Can a believer stand and see that enemy killing, coming to kill him, to destroy him, and to away his life without defending himself with any spiritual uh, exercises or that or, and all that now if somebody if somebody is trying to kill you you know there's always somebody trying to kill somebody <laughs> <laughs> now places like that you know so what do you understand that a weapon of our welfare is god it's not kind of it's not it's spiritual. It's all about praying, prayers. <laughs> not about prayers. It's, you exercise your spiritual, your spiritual powers are not that. You know, that my, you know that my brother. You know, there's something which is there was a question that I mean to come and answer it. How do you fight spiritual battle? And then I was, I was the Lord said, you see, these people, they always like to fight instead of obey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, you know my, my brother, we always like to fight a battle instead of obedience. Now, listen to me. He said, the weapon of our way, I think you are talking about what? Let's talk, Pastor Charles, please, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. Let's us look at 3 to 5 before we look at 6 of it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. Now hang on one second. Although we walk in the flesh, but the reason we do not walk according to the flesh is what? My people, my people. Spirit. Huh? God is in us. How is God in us? Because we obey. Okay, so that's what you're going to see now that they've been told that God, the Spirit of God, is telling you. That's why I say that the weapon of warfare is only when God is in us. How is God going to be in us? You will see it all answered there. Pastor, start go on, please. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. How is God in us? Spirit of God. The Spirit of God in us. The Spirit of God is not to pull down whose stronghold? Our strongholds. Oh, God bless you, favor. Let, uh, I mean, let us understand that. Pastor said, please listen first of all. The Spirit of God is not because what? That's how he's pulling the, our strongholds. We destroy our strongholds. That is what you do. If you want the weapon of welfare to be God, you have to be one with God. Go on, Pastor Charles. Send down arguments mm -hmm. and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's all telling you about how you can have God as a weapon of your warfare. All stronghold things keeping you stronghold, keep separating you from God. You must pull down. You must cast down all arguments, pride, all the things that is in you of the flesh, and everything heightened in you that is what is itself against the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? Obedience. We, you will see it now. The knowledge of God is obedience. We're going to come to that. So anything that will bring you to obedience you must do and cast down anything that, go, that goes contrary to that of bring, uh, bring it. bringing every thought captivity, into captivity 
to the obedience of Christ. Everything I'm telling you there is there. That's what you're supposed to do, innocent. Not praying. How are you going to pray when you are seeing in you? God is not hearing it. You are weak already because you are praying against your own master. That's not going to happen. The master is the devil because you are praying and then you are as a slave of the devil. That will not work. That's why if you look at six, read everything together. Pastor Charles, six, please. Be ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When are you ready to punish all disobedience? I can't hear. When we have turned away from all evil. Listen to the scripture there. God. When you fulfill your obedience. When you have fulfilled your obedience. How do you fulfill your obedience? Then that goes back to what Favor is saying. So, how do you fight all these battles? Pass innocent. That's it. So what am I trying to tell you here? You want to get God to be one with you, then God who is one with you, who can, who can challenge him? That's it. But you can, if you want to do vigil all night, praying, praying, go ahead and pray. And the, the devil said, look at this, my servant. Oh, Paul, I know. Yeah, Jesus I, Christ, I know. Who are you? Uh -huh. <laughs> I know Paul. Oh, so, so, so it has come to this in Lagos. My own servant is telling me what to do. Huh? Paul, I know. Christ, I know. But who, who are you? <laughs> who are my servant? <laughs> so, Pazino said, that's, that's the way it is, my brother. That's the, that is that the faulty foundation we have that you think that prayer is the key. Prayer is not the key. Yes. Yes. Obedience is the master key. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.